Never in her life had she felt as rested and tired at the same time as she did when she arrived at roll call the next day. It had been a while since she didn't want to get out of bed for another reason than simply not wanting to work. It turned out that she actually still knew how to enjoy herself, given the right motivation. And, well, the last night had given her plenty of motivation. Although her fellows, gawking at her with prying knives while awaiting their orders in the lineup, most likely suspected that a lot more had happened than actually did. Now that her and James had decided to spend a considerable amount of time together, they were in no rush. However, with the nervousness that had kept them both pretty hesitant the first time around, having dissipated, now they had done it all before, the night had still been plenty enjoyable. She was much more comfortable sleeping in just her underwear than with sleeping fully clothed, which had also allowed her to comfortably slip under the covers alongside James. Turns out that either humans had some very interesting instincts when it came to cuddling, or James had more experience than he had let on, judging by how he handled the situation. Even though she never would have suspected it, being tightly squeezed into somebody while sleeping was something that she actually didn't mind at all. Restricting as it felt, it also had a weirdly calming effect. In the end, the comparatively tame experience was more than intimate enough for the two of them to enjoy themselves, but she was still deciding whether she would let on how far, or not far, they actually went, especially now that the captain neared her position in the line. Chief Petty Officer Philip! The giant to her left was already being called out, and loudly gave back her. Present, sir. When Captain Uton now stepped over to her, she of course still stood at full attention, and showed respect. However, as their eyes locked, she could see the turmoil in his, and tried to return it with a sort of calm satisfaction. Petty Officer Shida, he loudly called out. Present, sir, she answered. Both of them not showing more than slight hints of what most likely everyone around knew was going on in their minds. The captain quickly finished his way down the line of his subordinates, and then stepped back to address everyone. At ease, a voice rang out, and everyone relaxed where they stood. Alright people, you know the drill. We are rapidly approaching the great community station, and we intend to dock there, so preparations are in order. We've done this many times, so everything should go off without a hitch. Listen to your superiors and work dutifully. We won't have to invest any more of our precious time into this than absolutely necessary. Captain Uton loudly proclaimed, looking everyone in the lineup up and down. I know many of you are excited for your time of leave on the station, and you all have earned it, but I don't want to see anyone slacking now so close to the finish line. Understood? Yes, sir. It loudly echoed back at him. Very well. The captain amusedly chuckled. Off to work, then. Right away, the line burst apart with everyone hurrying towards their respective briefing. Shida already saw where Division Officer Dalzam was waiting, and from her periphery, she could see that Cliff was also here, and also moving towards the same destination. They respectively greeted the DO and stood at attention, awaiting their orders. I'll keep this brief, since the two of you should be very familiar with this process by now, Nalsam signed dismissively. Petty Officer Shida, you will take command of Division Team 5, convening at Gate Number 5. With your team, you will coordinate the preparations for, as well as the execution of the deceleration of the gravitational spin. Since he has a lot of experience in that specific task, Petty Officer Cliff will assist you in this as your second in command. You two will find your exact orders on your assistance. Understood? Yes, ma'am, the two Petty Officers loudly replied. Very well, you are dismissed. Dio Nalsam signed. Off to work. Gate 5 was a bit out of the way from their position, so they immediately started to swiftly make their way there. While they walked, Shida could see and feel Cliff eyeing her intensively from beside her. So, him too, huh? She thought. If you have something to say, speak up, Petty Officer, she ordered, without slowing down her march across the bridge. The shining lights of the computer screens whizzed past the two of them as they quickly traversed the dark room. From their position, the captain was already sitting sideways on the wall, where he had to look upwards to follow the two of them with his gaze. Uh, nothing, ma'am, Cliff responded respectfully, quickly turned his gaze off of her and bring it back forward. Shida sighed, quickly glancing around to make sure that nobody would be attentive enough to notice her breaking protocol, she quickly whispered, We can talk about it later. Concentrate now, at least as long as we're around the juniors. The blue eyes of the raptor studied her face curiously for a moment, 
before he gave an acknowledging nod. Team 5 consisted of 6 shipmen, all of which were your typical giant herbivores, most of them mammalian, with one reptile and a crustacean between them. They also weren't very good at hiding the burning nosiness in their gazes, even as they respectfully addressed Shida as their superior. As the entire team stood at attention while staring forward, Shida thought about how long it had been since she had been given command. In addition to their blatant, gossip fuel curiosity, the people now under her supervision regarded her with the same mixed feelings about being supposed to follow her orders that she was used to. They were very lucky. Since she was in an exceedingly good mood today, she wouldn't start the day by chewing them out for their lack of respect. They could thank James for that. She quickly checked her assistant, studying the exact tasks they were assigned for. It all looked pretty manageable. Alright people, she finally spoke up, her team snapping to attention. Our task for today is very straightforward, so I demand that you not mess this up. You are under my command for today, therefore you better do your darndest to make sure that none of you make me look bad, or I will hold you personally responsible. You got that? Yes ma'am, the ship and bellowed back at her. Being authoritative or standing in front of people twice your size used to be quite the challenge for her in the past, not made any easier by the fact that it was hard for her to get the due respect from people to begin with. However, that was in the past. By now she had developed the necessary aura to make people fall in line. It helped to let her prey drive take over and use the natural presence this granted her in the room, her body language rooting her as a threat in the minds of many other species. The sinking feeling that one might get mauled when they stepped out of line seemed to keep people careful, even if it was unfounded. I will hold you to that, she loudly informed them, before getting to the matter at hand. Alright, first of all, Petty Officer Clear and myself will handle the actual deceleration of the gravitational spin ourselves. Your task will be supporting us in this. I am going to need four of you to prepare the crew for the deceleration. After I make the official announcement, those four will control the ship, starting the bridge and working their way down to the cargo area. They will ensure that the necessary processes are initiated everywhere without fault. They will also ensure that every crew member is informed about the deceleration process and the ensuing lower gravity, and nobody has missed the wake-up call. Any volunteers? As if they had practiced it beforehand, exactly four of the six shipmen stepped forward, volunteering for the task. Certainly a pleasant surprise. Perfect, she just said with a clap of her hands giving each one of the volunteers a once over. Pointing at each of them one after another, she started to distribute the tasks among them. Using this gate, gate 5, as the point of 360 degrees, you will be handling the ship's area from 1 degree to 90 degrees rotation-wise. You will be responsible for 91 degrees to 180 degrees. You will handle 181 degrees to 270 degrees. And lastly, you will handle 271 degrees to 360 degrees. Let me preface this next thing with this first. You shouldn't be, but if you are still unsure of what processes need to be ensured for the smooth termination of the deceleration process, you can always check your assistance for further information. I expect updates from you at least every half uniform hour, as well as every time there are any complications. Did I make myself clear? Each of the shipmen gave a readback of their assigned area, ending with, Updates to you every half uniform hour. Understood, ma'am. Shida nodded confidently. Then she addressed the remaining two shipmen directly. As for the two of you, she said loudly, making sure they were paying close attention to her. You will be tasked with the preparation of the bridge itself. Now, most people here are ranking personnel and will initiate the necessary steps themselves, so your job will be quite easy. Like your comrades, you will be assisting where assistance is needed, to make sure that no necessary process is forgotten or neglected. You will also update me on your process every half uniform hour, and immediately inform me should problems arise. Your task will most likely take less time, so once you are done with it, you will be giving assistance to your teammates, understood? Understood, ma'am, the shipman replied, almost eagerly. Shida sneered. Getting to give orders again was pretty satisfying. All right, off to work, don't dawdle, she ordered, and the line of shipmen was promptly set in motion, hurrying towards their assigned tasks. As soon as Shida was sure that they were out of earshot, she dropped most of her authoritative posture, relaxing her shoulders while turning towards Cliff. And we will be getting to work as well, she said, indicating the Raxes to move with a sideways nod of her head, before turning towards the terminal supervising the gravitational spin. The terminal was currently occupied by Petty Officer Brujak, 
who had apparently been unlucky enough to get the shift right before the docking process was officially started. Sadly, preparing for docking meant a calling of all hands, or claws in Rujak's case, so he would get a new task as soon as they replaced him. Petty Officer Rujak, we will be replacing you now, Sheeta said, with a quick salute towards the large crustacean. Now that she thought about it, it looked like one of her shipmen was of the same species as him. Rujak looked over at Sheeta with a harsh expression. Apparently, he was in an understandably bad mood, and it wasn't helped by having to interact with her of all people. However, Sheeta did technically outrank him, and even in her good mood, she gave him a challenging look, daring him to try and directly disrespect her. However, he hesitated only shortly, before bringing his legs into the X position and crossing his claws, and evacuating the post, scuttling away. Sheeta didn't waste a look after him, instead immediately getting to work on adjusting the terminal to her proportions, and splitting the control between her and Cliff. I will be handling the controls. You will keep an eye on the related readings and handle communications with the other teams, she ordered, this time in a casual tone while starting to slowly unlock the manual controls of the system, removing some of the constant restrictions imposed by the ship's computer, and allowing her to change the angular velocity. Cliff kept a close eye on the numbers on screen, making sure no value was behaving in an unpredicted manner. After the locks had been released and the process could be started, he addressed Sheeda. Preparations are complete. Ready for the announcement, ma'am, he said, keeping his eyes glued to the screen. Sheeda nodded. With a quick move of her arm, she activated the communication and connected it with the intercom. It only took moments for her request to be processed and the channel to be opened. Clearing her throat, she loudly started the announcement. To everyone on board of the GES-32, to all crew members, this is Petty Officer Sheeda speaking to you. We are currently approaching the Great Community Station with the intention of docking there. To allow for the docking, the gravitational spin of the ship will shortly be decelerated. To prepare for this, Ship Protocol 15 is now coming into effect. Follow the steps outlined by the protocol, initiate the necessary processes outlined for your affiliation, and cooperate with the ship's administration and security teams. I repeat. She had to make the full announcement three times total, and it took her some effort to keep her voice and tone consistent throughout. After she had made the third full readout, she cut the channel again. A sigh escaped her lips as she loosened up her shoulders. Apparently, she had tensed up without noticing it while she made the announcement. And now to circle for a while, Cliff commented from beside her. He still didn't take his eyes off the screen, but it was clear he also relaxed a little. If she'd interpreted his idiom correctly, he was implying that they were going to supervise for a while now. They could only start the actual deceleration once at least the essential preparations were completed, which would most likely take some time. However, the protocol said that during that time, manual control over the gravitational spin had to be established and kept up until the time the docking was completed. She was sure that there was a reason behind that once, even if she couldn't recall it. It was probably outdated by now anyway. The entire preparation process was in essence a mere overcautious measure. The deceleration was executed so carefully that there would never be forces exceeding even 5% of the galactic standard in effect. In the corner of her vision, she could see Cliff once again getting nervous in his non-existent boots even if he could prevent glancing at her by focusing on his numbers. It was quite obvious that he had heard the rumours, and knowing Shida, he wanted clarification. But she had already said it, and she wouldn't repeat herself. If he wanted the juicy details, he would have to ask. Eventually, the first report of their team came in. Everything appeared to be going smoothly on board, so it was fairly brief. After acknowledging the updates of the shipman and cutting the line, a long yawn escaped Sheeta's lips, as the mere action of standing in front of the gravitational terminal was enough to make her quite sleepy after having spent so many shifts doing nothing else. From the corner of her eyes, she could see Cliff's pupils constrict to the smallest of dots while he looked at the screen. Long night? he asked, without looking away from the displayed numbers, but obviously implying something. You could say that, Sheeta answered, and stretched for a moment trying to get the tiredness out of her joints. A moment of silence arose, as Cliff didn't immediately follow up on that answer. But his curiosity had been spurred now. So, he eventually broke the silence again, trying to sound casual. You and James, huh? What about us? 
Shida replied dryly. If he wanted gossip, she would make him work for it. You slept in his room, the raptor half stated, and half asked, still seemingly later focused on his task. I did, Shida answered matter-of-factly. And in his bed? Cliff inquired further, now not being quite able to restrain himself from throwing a quick glance over at her, most likely trying to catch her reaction. Indeed, Shida answered unenthusiastically, and fearing that this sign of questioning could be going on for some time, she also added, and even in his arms. Cliff's pupil was constricted again, and he couldn't stop himself from looking at her in surprise in time. The feathers on his forehead now started to slightly stand up. A small smile came across Shida's face. This was actually pretty fun. So, what happened? Cliff now pried, not overplaying his curiosity with polite restraint any longer. Shida pretended like she needed a moment to remember what had happened just last night. Well, we cuddled, she said thoughtfully, playing the unsuspecting airhead. He complained a lot that I moved my tail too much. I asked him how he managed to have cold hands even in this heat, and then we fell asleep pretty quickly. Cliff looked at her suspiciously, his eyes scanning her expressions carefully. Sheeta's innocent mask turned to an impish sneer as she slightly looked back at him, her tail waving around playfully. What? Did you expect something more slippery? She teased, putting as much of an underhanded undertone into her voice as she could. Cliff clearly felt exposed for a moment, as more of his feathers started to stand up in what Sheeta supposed to be embarrassment. But to his credit, he didn't back down. Well, was that all that happened? He said, still looking a bit flustered, but otherwise sounding earnestly curious. He was persistent, she would give him that. She just shrugged the question off while turning back towards the terminal screen. Well, we both enjoy skin contact, and James's people find having a purring partner in bed with them even more relaxing than my own. I also found out that I like the way humans constrict you while they cuddle, even though it felt a bit claustrophobic at first, she explained passingly. It's no wonder we were both lulled to sleep pretty quickly. The pure thought of the warm oasis of comfort that she had found herself in that night caused her to yawn loudly again, interrupting her retelling. We also found out that we both like being scratched, as long as I'm careful with my claws, she finished, the yawn still slightly distorting her voice at first. But our hands stayed in the areas for good boys and girls. Cliff thought about that for a moment. He seemed to try and fit this new information into the picture he surely had already made up in his mind when he had first heard the rumours. Shida also had a sinking feeling that a certain white feathered mate of his had probably fueled the fire in that department a bit. Probably needing to recontextualize some of his thoughts on the situation, he then added, And you were not tempted at all? Well, I wouldn't say not at all, Shida answered, not even the slightest bit coy. She thought back to the suspicious bump in James's groin area that she had woken up to two times by now. James did say that an erection in the morning was perfectly normal among human males. However, she still liked to take credit for it in her mind. Then, Cliff carefully inquired further, thoughtfully gazing in Shida's direction but looking right through her. What does that make you two now? Wow. That was surprisingly tactless. Sheila looked at her colleague disapprovingly, as he had asked the annoying question that she and James had managed to skillfully avoid so far. Cliff had apparently noticed that that had been the wrong question to ask, because he quickly and embarrassingly turned back to the computer screen and mumbled, Forget I asked. Sheeda shook her head, and also turned back towards the display while she passingly answered, Well, we're still figuring that out. The signs are pointing in a good direction, though. I'm... Glad to hear it, Cliff meekly replied. Rolling her eyes, Shida simply responded, Appreciate it. Alright, that should be good now, James said, putting his hands on his hips while contently looking at the flasks and test tubes he had secured within the fringe of his laboratory. He had used copious amounts of sponge and tape to make sure that his samples and chemicals would not be in any danger of sliding or moving at all while the ship's velocity changed. He closed the door with his foot and turned towards the myriad of devices used in his work that were now chained to the wall within their racks, keeping them locked in place as well. 
the only thing he couldn't help out were the rats. Sadly, the tiny troopers would have to cope with the change in gravity themselves. They would get used to it quickly enough, he was sure. Walking along the roads one more time, he made sure all of the cages were locked tight. If the animals were ever going to actually escape, it would probably be when they could clear more than three times the height of their enclosures in a single bound. Then he also patrolled the racks again, pulling hard on each chain, making sure they would hold. His lab was now officially ready for the docking, and he could leave it be with a clear conscience. He would patiently wait for his return. It almost felt wrong, shutting his work down like this when he only had been working on the ship for a few months. But this vacation was more or less mandatory, so he tried not to sweat it too much. And having already finished up his own cabin earlier today, he was now done with his duties pertaining to the docking process. Behind him, Curie was patiently waiting for him to finish up his last round of checkups. They had, at his suggestion, also already secured their own living space, and were therefore as stranded as he was now. Wondering if they would bother checking his lab, even though they should be able to see that he had secured it, he threw a glance over his shoulder at the computer terminal in the wall. Bye bye, you pests, he thought to himself, as he finally left the room, leaving the door open, so that the security could quickly see that it was done when they did their rounds. Letting his eyes wander through the hall, he could see the rare sight of all the lab doors being wide open at the same time. Crew members hurrying in and out while rushing to secure their work and belongings. Well, all lab doors except for one still very crumpled looking and still very much sealed door, of course. What now? Curie asked from beside him, their synthetic voice carrying out against the white noise of the working and chatting crewmates remarkably well. James shrugged. Want to check how the others are doing so far? He asked, only hesitantly tearing his eyes away from the grumpy guard standing in front of Curie's former laboratory. They had still not stopped sending people to guard the destroyed room. Maybe they wanted to get rid of his contents while the ship was being resupplied. After all, his own terminal would also be repaired during that time, setting their plans back again. It was likely that, if they wanted to gain any ground in this case, they would have to do it soon, and their stop at the GCS might just be the thing they needed to shake up the power dynamic. Curie shifted their body into a movement that equated to a shrug for them. They didn't exactly seem enthused, but they also had nothing better to do. After all, their newest little invention was already safely stored within James's suitcase. He'd been amazed at how quickly they had managed to put something together that seemed so sophisticated to him. Then again... That might just have been him being uneducated on the topic. Even tuning into the computer's frequency had been no problem. He had expected that they would at least need to borrow the thing for that, but somehow they had figured it out without it. Did they maybe have some device that could detect frequencies built into their body? Should he ask them? They would most likely than not be excited about his interest rather than insult it. Then again, he didn't want to disappoint them by only understanding the very surface of what they would explain him about it. Maybe he was just thinking too much. While he followed that train of thought, they quickly traversed all over the pleasingly empty corridors. In the end, he didn't follow up on his idea, and they suddenly arrived at Quiz's lab. James had unthinkingly steered towards this location first, even though he didn't know why. Maybe it was because he imagined the small and sometimes sluggish Quiz possibly needing his assistance the most. Quiz's lab door stood just as open as all the others across the hall. James carefully peeked inside, gingerly knocking at the doorframe. Quiz, who had been in the process of chaining some sort of crate to the wall, turned towards him. Waving, James slowly entered the lab, looking around. Every time he came here, he knew how Moore must have felt, back when he invited her into his own workspace after they had first met. Everything was basically child-sized to him, and Quiz's entire equipment, plus furniture, took up only about a tenth of the room's area. Looking at the tiny devices, he still wasn't entirely sure what Quiz was actually working on. They had tried to explain it to him before, but he had to ashamedly throw in the towel after the basics. What he had understood was that it was some form of advanced physical research and to work for the ionisation of noble gases as a way to conserve energy. But that was where his grasp of the concept ended. He couldn't even remember hearing about something similar on Earth, so either he was being ignorant again, or the concept was actually utterly alien to him. He knew that the research seemed to need devices with many transparent tubes, though. Devices that he had no idea how to use or how they worked. Quiz greeted him and Curie with a quick gesture. 
Need any help? James asked casually, while shining through the largely empty room. Curie just behind him. I'll take any I can get, Quit submitted in sign, looking a bit exhausted. Being pretty much a veteran on the ship, they had been through this process many times and were probably used to it. But the years were also catching up to them, so it still didn't come easy. James and Curie being many times the size of them and a lot more flexible in their movements, quickly let them explain what needed to be done and pretty much finished the work within minutes. Even though he felt bad about it, James couldn't help but feel like he was cleaning up the playthings of a child while he was handling the tiny apparatus. Either way, the work was done in the end. Thank you, Quiz signed, after they checked if everything was properly secured, just like he had done in his lab earlier. No problem, James replied, slightly cringing at the grinding sound Quiz's scales made while moving around. He still hadn't gotten over that, and while standing this close, he could hear it all too well. He wished that it wasn't like that. He liked Quiz, and it really irked him that he couldn't seem to get over his physical reaction towards them, even though someone else had managed to get adjusted to his, and more importantly, Curious peculiarities. Even though they were naturally way more averse towards those than he was towards Quiz. While they still had one of the other negative comment every now and again, Every one of them has stopped physically reacting to Curie's presence, and yet he couldn't get over something as stupid as his own uncanny valley. Just one of us left in the science wing, Curie stated, after they had taken their time studying the appearance of Quiz's devices. Maybe we should leave her alone, Quiz interjected, causing James and Curie to stare at them questioningly. She is in a foul mood. Did something happen? James asked, cocking his head to the side while looking down at his tiny friend. Yes, but I don't think it is my place to talk about it, Chris explained glumly, their arms moving slowly while signing, before focusing on James specifically. But you should know that your presence right now might exasperate the problem. Well, that didn't sound good. Had he done something to upset more? He couldn't think of anything. Last time they had talked was after his call with Nia, and he felt like they had parted on good terms. An awkward worry crept up on him while he thought about it, this wasn't about him and Sheeta, was it? No, it couldn't be. Or could it? Would Maul really worry about something like that? And even if she did, would she really take exception to it for some reason? And now he was torn. On one side, his curiosity had been awakened, and he wanted to know what it was that troubled her. On the other side, he had been explicitly warned that he might be adding to the problem. So, it would be, scientifically speaking, a real dick move to walk up to her to try and find out. He found himself unable to make a decision on the matter, as Quiz looked at him in what he assumed to be empathy, even though he still couldn't really read them. In the end, the decision was made for him. Curie had unexpectedly started towards the exit, leaving James and Quiz to stare after them, the metal legs clanking across the lamp's floor. Where are you going, Curie? James asked, baffled, and almost inadvertently started to follow them. Quiz did the same. I am going to Moore's laboratory, Curie answered matter-of-factly. She might need our help. Bad mood or not, not offering it to her after doing so with everyone else wouldn't be fair. Also, being in a bad mood all by yourself is no fun. As much as he might have wanted to, James couldn't really argue with that. He looked over at Quiz, who seemed to have a very similar thought process. He waited for them for a moment, as they got ready to scale the ladder to the recess in the wall they used to move around the ship. If you want, I can help you, James offered, as he watched the tiny person struggle for a while. Once they had gotten themselves into a position where they could comfortably sign again, they answered, James, I am more than twice your age. I will not let you carry me around unless I have to. Fair enough, James answered with a shrug, and started walking next to them in the direction of Moore's laboratory, right after Curie. He ran to the corner shortly after Curie had already arrived, Thank you very much, Curie, he could hear Moore say, even before he could see her. You can start by securing the doors of their cabinet if you want to. James just about saw Curie start to scuttle towards said cabinet, as he entered the room himself. Hey, Moore, he greeted, deliberately casual, while he heard Quiz enter the room behind him. Moore looked towards him, and he could immediately tell that something was different. The agitation was all over her face and even extended into the way she carried herself. Oh, hello you two, she said, while definitely trying to quell her irritation, 
even though the success left something to be desired. How nice of you to come to help. Of course, James replied sheepishly, scratching the back of his head. I'm afraid I won't be of much help, Chris signed, while looking at the giant equipment that Moore used in her work. Many of the items were about as large as Chris themselves. Oh, do not worry about it. Three of us should be plenty, Moore said, and then hesitantly added, There are just the three of you, right? Quiss nodded, moving their entire body up and down, while James answered, Yep, just us. Oh, good, Moore said, sounding honestly relieved, for the agitation still seemed to try and burst out of her. Quickly, she gave James a task he could reasonably fulfil. Of course, strength was not really the limiting factor, as he was reasonably sure he could lift most things that Moore could. Height, however, was more of a problem, as reaching some of the racks more than three metres off the ground while carrying the large, unwieldy equipment was a lot less achievable. The compromise they came up with was that James would bring the items over to Moore, who would quickly then lift them to their intended position. This worked out well since he was much quicker in moving around the room than the large, aged woman. While they worked, he could hear her huff and sigh, and he was pretty sure that it wasn't out of exertion. He also couldn't help but notice the sideways glances she was giving him every now and then, even though she made a valuable effort to try and not make it seem like his presence was provoking her. However, sneaking things past him was something that, at least for the moment, lay outside of her abilities. The next time he noticed her eye wandering over towards him, he returned her gaze with an honest, conciliatory look. Oh, do not look at me like that, Moore said exasperatingly, after letting out another long sigh. You want to tell me what I did so I can leave you in peace? James carefully asked with a coy smile. Moore let out a loud breath through her nose, her nostrils flaring in the process. She also shook out her fur around her head, and for a moment, it looked like she was bearing her horns towards him. Oh, it is nothing that you did. Moore finally responded once she looked at him again. At least not directly. Then what is it? He asked candidly trying to sound as reasonable in his request as he could. Moore took another deep breath, this time slower and more controlled. Then she did something that James could swear he had never seen her do. She actually crossed her arms, like a human would have done, or starting to stand completely upright, getting out of her usually slightly bowed position. Well, not that it should concern you, she said, and finally she started to sound as agitated as she clearly was, but apparently my son got married. Two things. First, Moore has a son. Don't worry about that right now. Second, Moore's son got married. React appropriately. His brain robotically ordered him. Congratulations? He said, managing to bring just the right amount of confusion into his voice in the last second, as he noticed that she actually didn't sound too happy about that. Thank you, Moore replied with half-suppressed irritation, I know that I should be happy about this, but that boy is driving me up a tree. Weirdly similar, but differently used idioms aside, they seem to be getting somewhere. You don't like his spouse very much? James timidly wagered a guess. He had limited experiences with this, so he'd better tread carefully. Well, I would not know. I have never even heard of her before, Moore answered, the anger in her voice swelling up again. It was an in-the-moment decision, and they had to do it right then and there, he says. Can you imagine just getting married without telling your mother? Really, the wrong person to ask this question, James quickly and honestly admitted, raising his hands defensively, because that was in fact exactly what he would have done. But maybe it really was important that they did it quickly. At least he now understood why Chris thought that his presence might irritate more further, with the rumours about him and Sheeda floating around and all. Quite possibly, but still, he should have told me about it, she firmly stated while huffing a bit. More were in the intergalactic void, there was no way to reach us, James replied, trying to be reasonable. More, who either didn't quite hear or decided to ignore him, kept ranting further. You raised the boy for years and years, and this is the thanks you get. Unbelievable. James pondered how he could calm her down, carefully approached the large woman, and reached out to her forearm which was about the highest point he could reach for now. I'm sure he didn't mean to upset you, he said calmly, rubbing her arm through her thick fur. He was pretty sure that was true. They must have usually had a good relationship if this was how she reacted. 
Thinking of a new way to approach the subject, he asked, Was his wife not with him when he made the call? She was, Moore admitted, almost dismissively. And how was she? James continued, leaving her no time to start another rant while staying in a calming tone. We did not really get the chance to talk, Moore said defensively, looking away from James for a moment. So she probably wasn't exactly in the mood to talk once they had broken the news to her. James gave her a straight look when she glanced at him every now and then. Well, she seemed nice enough, Moore reluctantly admitted. And my Muin was never one to make rash decisions lightly. I raised the boy right, after all. You must have done something right if he managed to get himself a fine spouse, James replied, hoping to summon up some positive feelings towards the situation. Even though he seemed to be handling things with grace, he still felt out of his depth here. And indeed, it seemed that Moore's mood cleared up after he said that. In fact, she seemed to be turning a bit amused. And was that a hint of mischievousness he detected in her eyes? What had he just awakened? So, I guess your mother raised you right too, then? She said with a sort of malicious joy seeping over the anger in her voice. I heard what is going on between you and Shida. Giving yourself some credit here, are we? Oh boy. So they were doing this now. Well, my mother wasn't really interested in raising me, James responded honestly, and to his own surprise he stayed completely collected while doing it, but I think my Uncle Flynn did a pretty good job, even though he wasn't trying to. That had immediately killed the mood again. Moore's snark melted into a sort of mortified visage. Oh well, easy come, easy go. And if the mention of her name had summoned her, Sheila's voice suddenly rang out through the room. To everyone on board the GES-32, to all crew members, this is Petty Officer Sheeda speaking to you. We are closing in on the Grant Community Station and will surely begin the deceleration of the gravitational spin. Complete any yet unfinished preparations and brace for lower gravity. At that, James snapped up, pulling away from Moore and quickly getting back to work. The conversation at hand had been banished from his mind by the realisation that it was going to start soon. Everyone in the room stared at him confusedly, as Moore asked, What has gone into you now? We gotta hurry, James quickly exclaimed, while carrying one of Moore's huge devices towards her. There's no way I'm missing this.